I'm glad uh, uh, the presumption which some people had uh, that spectrum is worth zero has been belied. The government garners over 1 lakh 9,000 crore rupees from the Spectrum auction which ends after 19 days of fierce bleeding. Almost 90% of the Spectrum on offer is sold. Vodafone expected to make the highest payout of more than 34,000 crore rupees followed by Bharti and Idea. The government junks gas pooling slang clears a new policy to revive stranded gas-based power plants. Gale and JS failed to import gas at spot prices. Government to auction gas via reverse bidding process. Domestic allocations of gas will not be touched. A number of those projects have been started. Some of them which are halfway through, I think we need to put some lifeline into them. And we are seriously looking at it. The government will provide a lifeline to revive stalled road projects as the finance minister adds. The focus of the government will now be on a comprehensive agri-reform package. JP also says the current interest rate regime is too high but refuses to comment on whether the RBI governor should have a fixed tenure. We are expecting a synergy benefit of 250 million over next three years. Sun Pharma completes its merger with Rand Baxi, becoming the world's fifth largest genetics pharma company with combined revenues of over $5 billion. MD Dilip Shangvi says the group will look at boosting R&D with an investment of more than $300 million. Manmohan Singh, Kumar Mangalam Birla and former Coal Secretary P.C. Parak moved the Supreme Court challenging the summons issued against them by the CBI Special Court. In the coal scam, the former Prime Minister maintains there was no favoritism shown to Hindalco. Supreme Court will take up the matter tomorrow. After Jindal Steel and Power, Balco becomes the Delhi moves the Delhi High Court against the cancellation of his bid for Gare Palma 4x1 coal block, alleges the cancellation is arbitrary and without reason. The High Court to hear the plea tomorrow. The market regulator notifies new delisting norms, makes it compulsory for at least 25% shareholder participation for any delisting unless the company can prove that all shareholders have been contacted. Buyback regulations and takeover regulations have also been amended. India could have a new black money law by the end of the budget session of parliament. It's a money bill and will not require the approval of the Rajya Sabha. High value transactions including those of 1 lakh cash will require a PAN number. Kerala Finance Minister K.M. Money appointed the chairman of the state finance minister's GST panel. Money will head the panel for a year uh, or at least till the GST comes into place. This is with immediate effect. I would like to invest in Indigo if there is any stake in, in that airline available. Qatar wants a bigger chunk of the pie in India, the Middle Eastern nation, looking at various options of investments. Qatar Airways CEO says the airline is interested in picking up stake in Indian carriers. On the hour, the present government has a big task on hand. It needs to set right UPA government's failed rural employment guarantee scheme, which may have just added to rural India's woes. A special report in part three of our ongoing series, What's Ailing Rural India? The new government under the Prime Minister has actually decided very clearly as to what its roadmap is. Creating infrastructure also, we really need to use this knowledge more effectively to understand what investment will bring in better results. It will be our focus to grow the business faster. No leader's economic vision can be achieved without uh, open air service. The idea of Russia, Russian Federation, to take initiative among the BRICS countries to form a group whereby we can articulate issues of common concern is indeed quite a welcome step. 
That's right. We have a power-packed lineup of heavyweights in the world of policy, politics, finance, and commerce. On what we promise is an edition of India Business Hour that's chock a block with news and big interviews. Absolutely, Nantara. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. Just a quick snippet before we go any further. We have the finance minister on key focus areas for the government. We have some farmers, Dilip Sangvi, on creating India's largest generic drug company, and then there's the CEO of Qatar Airways talking about. How he would like a piece of the indigo action. We also have Prime Minister Piyush Goyal on the government's attempts to revive gas-based power plants. Before we get you all of that, here's a quick check of what's been happening in the trading day. It was another day of consolidation on the last week today, with key indices being stuck in a tight range pretty much through the day. The Nifty closing marginally low at 8,530. The Sensex lost about 50 points, shutting shop at 28,111. The mid-cap stocks did have a better day today than the blue chip counterparts. That index holding out in positive territory. That's the stock market action. But after seven days of going from strength to strength, the rupee has finally thrown in the towel, at least for the day. The domestic currency weakening close to 62.32 to the dollar. That's on the back of a global dollar rally, as well as fresh dollar demand from importers. Some dealers indicate that the Reserve Bank may have stepped in over the course of the day to try and control the rupee's appreciation. But the big story, 19 days, 115 rounds, and over 1 lakh four rupees. Those are the key figures to keep in mind when we discuss the the telecom spectrum auction. Sources say that almost 90% of the spectrum on auction has been sold and bidding was seen across bands. That's 800 megahertz, 900 megahertz and 1800 megahertz, also 2100 megahertz. The success of the spectrum auction has definitely made Finance Minister Arun Jaitley a happy man. At least FY16 onwards, FY15 continues to be a bit of a stretch because the Finance Minister is not clear whether he will actually get in the money from the spectrum auction for this particular finance, financial year. I asked him that question just a short while ago. Listen in. The government has got bids worth over more than 1 lakh crore rupees, sir. So FY16 onwards, you stand again on account of the spectrum auctions. But for FY15, sir, do you have some trouble there? Because you are going to have a shortfall as far as your spectrum receipts are concerned. No, if it's ended, I think... Uh, I, I do hope uh, the payments start coming in, but... Uh, <laughs> But in any case, I am glad uh, uh, the presumption which some people had uh, that Spectrum is worth zero has been belied. Well, that's the finance minister there. But let's go across to CNBC TV 18's Malvika Den. She's been tracking the auction. Malvika, uh, we don't have too many details because this is now a matter that the government will first have to take to court. Uh, so we do have limited details in terms of who's got what. But what are you picking up at this point in time? Well, let me just first address uh, the concerns of the finance minister. According to sources within ZOT, uh, there is a 10-day period which is going to be given to telecom companies after tomorrow's hearing uh, to make uh, the de initial uh, deposit uh, for claiming the Spectrum Airways. So it is unlikely uh, that any company is going to come forward uh, before the 31st of March to make this deposit. So as far as FY15 is concerned, uh, the government will have to make other arrangements because uh, they should not expect much as far as spectrum auction is concerned. Uh, in terms of the outcome of the spectrum auctions, 1,9874 crore rupees is the precise amount that the government has been able to garner from the of spectrum airways. What is it going to be the impact of this on the telecom sector is something that remains to be seen because remember in 2010 when the government had a bumper 3G spectrum auction, uh, the telecom companies ultimately suffered and this was passed on to the consumers by way of uh, sector, uh, the tariff hikes uh, that we had seen. Uh, in terms of the companies uh, which had participated in the auction, there were in total eight participants, uh, which could be clubbed into two categories, uh, Bharti, Vodafone, Idea, and Reliance Communications companies whose licenses were coming up for renewal and had to necessarily participate. We are picking up from sources that Vodafone has spent its maximum amount on Spectrum auctions and this was followed by Bharti Airtel. But on expected lines, most vulnerable was Idea Cellular, uh, whose licenses were coming up for renewal in nine circles and it has uh, probably suffered after the Spectrum auctions. The other set of companies, uh, Tata, Telly, Aircel, Uninor, and Reliance Geo, they have also bid for incremental spectrum, and this in uh, totality has contributed to a bumper spectrum auction for the government. 
All right, Malvika, appreciate you joining us with those details. Let's go across to Heyman Joshi of Deloitte Haskins and Sales. He joins us now with more details. Heyman, appreciate you joining us. Well, the government is in self-congratulatory mode because it's managed to mop up over one lakh uh, thousand, uh, one lakh crores uh, from the Spectrum auction. But what does this mean now for the telecom industry? What does it mean for an already debt-ridden industry? What is it going to mean for consumers in terms of tariff? Yeah, so the government has clearly come out as a winner. Whether the Indian telecom industry, India, and the and uh, and the Indian consumer benefit will depend on what happens with that uh, 18 billion dollars. Uh, for example, they have said that they want to spend this much money on the digital India, uh, and if that happens, then it can have a multiplier effect of eight to ten times on the GDP. But in the uh, in the in the nearer term, I think the tariffs will have to go up. Uh, the question is uh, the timing and the quantum. I think this will be determined by the uh, the competition on the ground. Mm. From a company specific point of view, Hemant, and uh, uh, you know this is something that you pointed out as well. Uh, you know that the asset turnover ratio of these companies will deteriorate further. That cash flow will be adversely impacted as well in terms of servicing of the uh, debt. Oh. What, who do you believe is going to be most significantly vulnerable at the end of this process? I think the industry as a whole is uh, really vulnerable. They have mopped up 60% uh, of the annual turnover of the telecom industry. So, you know, even if you take about 80%, the servicing cost of nearly 1 lakh crores is it's huge. So definitely the, the industry will have a challenge in profitability cash flows, uh, debt and, uh, you know, principal and interest servicing. And that is going to leave less funds for rollout of new technology, clearly. So, Hemant, what is this now going to mean as far as the government's Digital India initiative is, is concerned? Where does this leave that ambitious project? Because it's very clear that whether it's now or a couple of months down the line, if the regulator allows them to do it, uh, tariffs are going to be moving upwards. Yeah, so, so the, you know, as I mentioned, the, the government has said that, I think it's on their website, they're going to spend about $18 billion in the next few years on the building. Incidentally, now they have mopped up about $18 billion in just two and a half weeks. So if this money is invested in Digital India, I think you just see the multiplier effect it would have in the economy. Healthcare, education, agriculture, energy, fossil metering, you know, the uh, banking, all these sectors can benefit so definitely, the, ultimately, the Indian consumer will benefit, India, India will benefit. But it will depend, if there's a big if on how is this money used. That's right. Uh, there is a big if on that question. But the other big if, uh, and this is something that we've been discussing for a while now, Hemant, is on consolidation. There's been so much talk around consolidation, but do you believe that this process, the end of this round of auction, is now going to speed up the process of consolidation within the industry? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the huge pressures on margins and the profitability and the cash flows will definitely uh, will separate, the, you know, as they say, the, the men from the boys. And worldwide, there are three or four dominant players in telecom. And I think this is, uh, you know, very likely to happen in India also. Uh, but the consolidation, I think we have some challenges in terms of m &A guidelines, spectrum sharing, which needs to be ironed out and a clear policy statement needs to be made. You know. Absolutely. We are still awaiting clarity on the spectrum trading guidelines, which have perhaps held back the kind of consolidation that industry would have liked to see. But my final question to you, uh, do you believe that the regulatory overhang, the legacy issues that this sector has been mired in, in a sense, uh, while it is going to have to deal with stressed balance sheets, but at least the regulatory overhang, perhaps a thing of the past from here on? I think we are definitely uh, going to see, uh, you know, the uh, the less of uh, that pressure. Definitely, uh, more will be the business issues, the you know, the consolidation, the profitability, rollout of new technologies, digital India, uh, data play, so on and so forth. You know. Okay. All right, Hemant, we'll have to leave it there. We don't really have the details on which company has got what spectrum at what price. We are awaiting the government to first inform the court and then uh, get those details. And perhaps we could have those details tomorrow. But thanks very much for joining us with your first take on the impact of the spectrum auction, which concluded, concluded after 19 days. No one expected it to go on for this long, Nanda. And a pesa that will be received by the exchequer only in FY16. Now, this could be music to the ears of stranded gas trapped.
strapped power producers across the country. The cabinet today cleared a new policy to import gas. Gale and GSPL have been given the responsibility of importing gas, including spot uh, price gas, to supply to 31 stuck power plants at a concessional rate. The government will auction the gas via reverse bidding process to ensure power tariffs do not go up. Each plant can bid up to 30% of their plant load factor, 30% PLF. The domestic allocation of gas will not be touched. Uh, the power tariff has been uh, left at 5 rupees 50 paise a unit, and because it's reverse bidding, each power plant will have to bid and say how much subsidy is going to be needed. So the more efficient power plants are the ones that are going to survive. And Shireen, this is a total departure from what the industry is expecting. We are all expecting gas pooling. This is not pooling at all, Nanta. This no. is nothing what the government had thought about or what industry was anticipating as far as the pooling part is concerned because domestic allocation is not being touched at all. And perhaps it's a good move because there's going to be no discretionary power, Shireen. Well, at least the auction part of it is good news. Whether this is actually going to be enough or not, which is what the Power Producers yes. Association says, that this quantum is perhaps not going to be enough to revive stranded gas-based power plants, or at least not all of them, but then we'll, we'll wait and see. In fact, uh, Power Minister Piyush Goyal spoke with our colleague Anshu Sharma just a short while ago on the decision that's been taken by the Cabinet today to revive stranded gas-based power plants. Uh, we have decided that uh, the 14,000 odd megawatt of stranded capacity in gas and another 5,000 which is sub-rated at working at less than 30% PLF, they will all be given a support from the PSDF to help them increase their uh, power generation up to 30% of, uh, of the plant load factor. A lot of it is in southern India, which will help the states of South India increase generation, particularly in the peak period when it is required most. The advantage with the gas plants is that they can be ramped up quickly and ramped down within 15 minutes. So we can ensure that power is produced when it is most needed and bring down the energy shortage. So I believe the effort to reach power 24 by 7 to the people of India, this will be one major initiative towards that effort. How much of gas will be imported and uh, uh, what kind of support will Gale and GSPL will give to the states and what benefits will state get from the uh, import of these, go, uh, these uh, gas for the standard gas-based power project? Well, uh, the, uh, the central government, state governments, Gale, NTPC, everybody has chipped in mm -hmm. to support this whole initiative. Banks are also very happy to support the gas plants once they can see visibility of their getting into production. The big advantage is that the states or the center don't forego anything because this is only additional gas that will be imported. So there is no foregoing. All taxes on existing LNG continue to remain as it is. It is only on the additional gas that comes in as a part of this proposal where the government and the state governments will forego the taxation. Gale has uh, agreed to give some reduction in their pipeline and marketing margins, more so because for, uh, on a marginal, marginal costing basis, their pipeline is already there. This is only an incremental business, so it actually helps them enhance their profitability. The southern states will get power, which we cannot transmit for lack of adequate transmission facility, and the people of India will gain with bringing down the energy shortage, particularly in peak hours. It's a win-win for all and of course the banks are also going to be saved a lot of distress. Time. How much are you going to, uh, how much are these companies going to import and what will be the timeline the to bring in the reverse uh, expectation option? expectation is that uh, in the monsoon months, five months of monsoon, we will bring in about 10 MMS CMD per day mm -hmm. and in the non-monsoon seven months, about uh, 18. And we hope that we'll get down uh, to creating the framework for it and the technology backbone. Hopefully, we should be able to start in about 35 days from now. And what will be the re reverse auction of, uh, the, from the private companies? The uh, how is it going to help the is, bidders? Because it's not about private or public. We have ensured mm -hmm. that the companies will forego the entire return on their equity. So we are giving no benefit to any of the power plants. The benefit will only be given to the state discom. And the bidding will be to see who asks for the minimum subsidy to be able to generate and supply power initially at five and a half rupees per unit, and then we, the empowered group can will always this increase that. the fixed cost charges uh, which the companies wanted that it should be increased so that. On the contrary, we are not allowing them any return on their equity. So, if at all, it will only reduce their uh, fixed cost charges. 
but this will only help the banks take care of their assets and the people of India get affordable, low-cost power. Well, that's the power minister talking about the decision taken by the cabinet today to try and revive 31 stranded gas-based power plants. It's going to be done by importing gas and the gas is going to be allocated by reverse bidding auction uh, to the lowest bidder. GSPL and Gale will be the parties that will import the gas. Domestic allocation will not be touched. Now getting back to what the finance minister has to say, besides reacting on spectrum, Arun Jaitley also spoke to us about what the government is going to do to provide a major boost to the stuck highway project. Speaking with me at the Growth Net Summit earlier today, the finance minister said it's crucial for the government to revive all stalled infrastructure projects and also provide an impetus to the agri-sector which continues to be the backbone of the entire economy. And one possible way of gathering the necessary funds to provide this boost could come from an ambitious disinvestment program. Finance Minister saying that the list of candidates for strategic divestment, and important to note here, he's saying that not just loss making but even profit making PSUs could be up for strategic divestment. Also saying the current interest rate regime is too high and hopes that banks will act prudently. One issue that the Finance Minister doesn't want to talk about or get into a debate on is on whether or not India should follow global central banks and have a fixed tenure for the Reserve Bank Governor. Listen in. The original land bill or the act of 2013 had 13 exempted areas. Instead of 13, it's become 18. Please don't forget that this ordinance in those 13 exempted areas has also provided enhanced compensation. And therefore, that enhanced compensation to those 13 areas exists as long as the ordinance exists. Let me ask you about the infrastructure story, since that's something that you spoke about, Mr. Jaitley. The railway capex is up about 33% year-on-year after the budget. Defense capex for FI16 is higher by about 11%. You have talked about the tax-free bonds. You've talked about the India Infrastructure Investment Trust that you intend to set up. But by when do we actually see a turnaround as far as the capex cycle is concerned? And related to that question, since you brought up the example of roads and highways, the problem that we're facing today is a problem of broken private sector balance sheets. Uh, there was a lot of talk about reviewing and reviving the public-private partnership model. 3P India was a promise that you made in the previous budget. That decision, I understand, has been deferred for now. What can we expect in terms of reviewing public-private partnership models? And how do you address the issue of broken private sector well, balance sheets private, when it comes to infrastructure? The public-private partnership remains always an important instrument in executing all these projects. The difficulty is that what's happened in the last few years, the impact of that, as I indicated, if you saw the railways that you mentioned, the operating ratio was close to 94%, which means the railways was just uh, charging a tariff, paying salaries and just running the trains. There was no investment going into infrastructure. There was no investment going into railway safety. There was no... So with great difficulty, the, the railway minister said, uh, well, I'm not going to start any new project. I'm going to concentrate on existing uh, uh, projects and strengthening the existing infrastructure. And therefore, he's brought back the operating ratio down into the 80s. And I'm sure next year it will improve further when he can think of further expansion. So we are going to in, uh, looking at that sector. Similarly, the other two areas that you mentioned, the highways, as far as the current award of the highways is concerned, it's quite expeditious. And those projects have actually taken off. It's the legacy issues, the mess on my table that I inherited in terms of uh, 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 the highways, where I gave you this uh, illustration of uh, uh, you award uh, 77 projects and then say I'll do 20 kilometers a day and eventually 35 of them don't even take yeah, off. Yeah. And therefore, how to get them to exit? And there, there's a complicated legal methodology of exit because they've all to pay huge penalties to exit. So a dying sector is killed further if, if you try and enforce that. And therefore, you have to formalize a, a proper methodology by which they can exit and those who can execute those projects actually are able to come in. So a number of those projects have been started. Besides uh, enhancing the budgetary support as far as the highways is concerned, I had towards the, uh, a few months ago, uh, the 
one part of the benefit of the reduction of the oil prices had been passed on to the National Highway Authority. Right. In my finance bill, there is now a proposal to pass on a substantial part in terms of cess for highway authorities. It is going to go up to almost 8 mm. rupees. And 8 rupees on that cess actually means uh, 80,000 crores going into the National Highway Authority. The right. Part of it, I think, goes into the railways also. And therefore, when you have a highway authority which, which probably has an improved uh, liquidity, so these incomplete projects can also be assisted by them. There's some funding mechanism. There, there are a lot of decisions which the highway ministry is taking. You talked about strategic divestments in your budget, and a short while ago you told us that taxpayer money cannot go perpetually into funding loss-making public sector units. What are we to understand when this government talks about strategic divestments? Are we talking about the government giving up manage contr management control as you did in the cases see, of AZL and Valco? What does strategic divestment mean? You see, How soon I do we see a, you start? I have uh, fixed a large target this year. Even though in the current year, that's the current year which is coming to an end, I was not able to reach the final target I had set, but in terms uh, of numbers, this is the highest ever disinvestment uh, in terms of numbers which has yeah. taken place in any year. And therefore, I intend stepping it up the next year. There are a large number of companies that we have. And when I mentioned the word strategic disinvestment, you see, it, it has uh, a broad meaning. I'm not going to give a clue because, uh, you see, the moment you indicate companies, uh, you've done a lot of... Uh, Don't name the companies, sir, but are you willing to give up management control? But obviously, you see, in a strategic disinvestment, that's what it means. Supposing a completely loss-making unit which a government cannot at all revive. And this is only illustrative. It's not only going to be restricted to loss-making, but I'm giving you that example. Can I say that I want to divest, but I'll still keep control and the taxpayer will continue to fund those areas? It obviously can't happen. So why, when do we see this list being drawn up, sir, of strategic divestments that you're Well, the make? list has been drawn up, it's just that you don't know about it. In terms of uh, rate action, we've seen two out-of-turn policy rate cuts coming in from the Reserve Bank of India. There's a next credit policy up in April. We haven't yet seen a transmission impact on account of the previous policy cuts. I know that you've been gently nudging banks to, to try and move as far as rates are concerned. Do you anticipate another cut by the Reserve Bank in April? Well, and, and, and how significant is the rate cut going to be in order for us to achieve the kind of growth numbers that we're talking about? Well, uh, what is within the domain of the Reserve Bank, I'll let them have the last word at it. Uh, I mentioned um, a few days ago in the presence of the Governor that we don't pressurize the banks to cut rates, but we do expect uh, the banks, uh, after assessing the situation, uh, to act in a prudent manner. Uh, uh, our banks have been by and large responsible and I'm quite certain uh, uh, we'll see more cuts in future but as of today if you ask me how much and when it's in the domain of the Reserve Bank I'll leave, leave it to them. My own view has been that India needs to lower its, reserve, uh, ba uh, its interest rates. Uh, I, I won't prod you further on that but just a point forward on the Reserve Bank, sir, and there's been a lot of talk on whether we ought to move along with other central banks and have a fixed tenure as far as central bank governors are concerned in order to ensure financial stability. You've talked about regulatory stability. We're talking about financial stability. Is the government going to consider the possibility of a fixed tenure for central bank governors? Well, I think let others participate in this debate, and uh, I should speak at the very end. So what's your own view, sir? Let's, let's get you to start that debate. <laughs> no, I'd rather reserve my comments till the end. Well, the finance minister not willing to be drawn into the debate on whether we should have a fixed tenure for central bank governors. A well, former central banker certainly seemed to agree. By the Red D. Usha Thorat, the former deputy governor of the RBI, all suggesting that India should have a fixed tenure for the RBI governor's post. Now, the stage is set for the creation of India's largest pharma company, which will also be the world's fifth largest generic drug manufacturer. Almost a year after it was first announced, the merger between Sun Pharma and rival Randbax is now complete. The 7th of April has been set as the record date. Ranbaxi will be delisted from stock exchanges and shareholders will receive 8 shares of Sun Pharma for every 10 shares of Ranbaxi held. With the merger complete, Sun Pharma is now India's largest and the world's fifth largest drug maker with a combined revenue of $5.14 billion. Managing Director Dilip Shangvi says the major focus now is to win back the confidence of regulators and enhance productivity. Ekta Batra caught up with Shangvi and began by asking him what the margin picture of the combined entity could look like.
I think difficult for me to give you a predictable number right now. I think all I can say is that it will be our focus to grow the business faster. And uh, I think the solution to uh, margin problem is finding a way to ensure that uh, you have higher productivity from the same asset. So while we continue to focus on managing our business more cost effectively, the idea is that uh, we will also find a way to increase growth in each of our businesses so that uh, the increased profit generated from the new business will help us improve margin. Okay. So when you talk about that, can you tell us that whether the margins will be above 30 percent, maybe even slip below 30 percent, where do you expect it to settle even in terms of a range? So I think at some point of time when we give next year's guidance, we will come out with uh, what kind of uh, improvements that we are expecting. What we have shared with uh, investors and analysts is that we are expecting a synergy benefit of $250 million over next three years to be generated, uh, both from growth as well as from cost rationalization. The big challenges that you're going to face as a combined entity is to resolve the USFT issues which sure. have been plaguing Grand Baxi for multiple years now. A lot of analysts are perturbed with the fact that there hasn't been any sort of concrete development as yet despite all the steps which have been undertaken. What is the step forward? You did mention that you would want to bring confidence back into the regulators when it comes to Grand Baxi. How do you propose to do that? So my understanding is that uh, regulators have concerns about uh, the data coming out of Renbaxi facility. So they, I believe that trust is broken. Uh, and we have to find a way to regain that trust of the regulators. And that would be our focus. Okay. And what is your acquisition strategy considering that you will still effectively be a net cash company? What would you be looking at uh, maybe in terms of inorganic options, Indian companies in specific? No, as on today, I think as I said even in the press conference, I think we will focus on acquiring businesses which uh, will help us become more meaningful player in emerging markets mm. and uh, will have some kind of strategic rationale. We have never looked at acquisition for sake of acquisition.